Well, it was as a result of a very happy accident. Um, Nobu Kiyotaki had been kicked out of the United States for a couple of years because of visa difficulties, chose to came, come to London, where I work at the London School of Economics, and he had the office next to mine. The gods were good to us. And we didn't talk too much during the course of those two years, but towards the end, I ran out of material for my undergraduate lecture course um, at a topics, an advanced topics course. And I knocked on Nobu's door and said, Nobu, do you have anything that I might teach? And he said, well, yes, I do. I, I've got this paper that I've written with Randy Wright on money, a classic paper. And uh, I took this to the students and they loved it. And I loved teaching it. And I, I went round and thanked him for this and asked if had anyone tried to incorporate credit into that sort of framework? And he said, well, why don't we have a go? And that's how it all started. Well, um, it may help if I have a go at describing the key paper in the modern literature, the paper by Ben Bernanke and Mark Gertler that they published in 1989. Um, they took as their starting point the fact that investment, contrary to the standard model, is not simply a matter of one should finance the good investment projects and not finance bad ones, but that people who have ideas for investment projects may not have the money to pay for them themselves and they have to persuade other people to invest, to lend to them. And therein lies the source of a difficulty. The people who land may want to see some, it's a terrible phrase, but skin in the game on the part of the entrepreneurs themselves um, to keep them on the straight and narrow. Various difficulties to do with information or moral hazard can be invoked to justify that. But anyway, the key point is that the scale of investment is not only determined by the number of new ideas, that are in the economy, but also the amount of uh, money or net worth, as we call it, that the people with those ideas can put into the projects. And the less net worth they have, the fewer, the, the, la the smaller the scale of in overall investment. Bernanke and Gertler's paper ran with that idea and pointed out that when we move time forward to the next period, the, the net worth that these entrepreneurs have will be the profits from this period's investment. And that will determine the scale of next period's investment. And going further forward, the, the following period, the scale of investment will be determined by the profits from the middle period's investment and so on, so that you get a cascading forward in time. And that, mean, that can lead to the amplification and the persistence of shocks. Starting from what I've just said about the Bernanke-Gertler framework, where the scale of investment is in part determined by how much entrepreneurs can contribute from their own net worth, uh, Nobu Kiyotake and I pointed out that, of course, net worth in practice is the difference between two large numbers, assets minus liabilities, the balance sheet. And liabilities are very often in the form of debt, which are fixed, whereas assets are in the form of land, buildings, houses, equipment, um, tangible things which are used for production, but also can serve as collateral for loans. Now, the value of those assets fluctuates with the price of them, meaning that the gap between the asset value and the liabilities, the difference between two large numbers, can move quite a lot. And that means, going back into the logic of Bernanke and Gertler, that investment can move quite a lot too. I don't know whether it helps, but could I give a, an anecdote from what was actually happening in my life at the time that we were thinking about this research? Um, for family reasons, I was needing to move from London to Edinburgh. This was in the early 1990s. 
And, and that meant selling my London house, um, which, for sake of argument, let's say was worth £100,000, and buying a somewhat bigger family home in Edinburgh. Now, it was my bad luck that the property market was tumbling at this point. Prices in both London and Edinburgh were falling. And I had an outstanding mortgage on my London property. And again, for sake of discussion, let's suppose that was £90,000 worth of debt. Meaning my net worth at that point was initially 10,000. The gap between the value of my London house, 100, and the value of my liabilities, 90. Now, if you do a little calculation here and think, well, suppose, as it in fact happened, London prices and Edinburgh prices fell by 5%, then the value of my London house would fall, or did fall, from 100 down to 95, which eroded my net worth from 10 down to 5, which is a huge drop, because that net worth was what I was, in effect, presenting to borrowers in Edinburgh when I was wanting to buy my Edinburgh property. So, you see, the, although it was only a 5% fall in the London house price, it constituted a 50% fall in my net worth, which meant that I was in a much worse shape when I was moving north to Scotland to buy, try to buy my Edinburgh property. And I realised this <laughs> painfully from my, in, within my own private life as I was discussing the economics of things with Nobu. And I realised that actually... The, the size of the house that I was going to end up being able to afford in Edinburgh would go down when the price went down, which to an economist is a very surprising notion. I mean, normally one buys more of something when the price falls, but here was I buying, in effect, less of something, the house in Edinburgh, when the prices were falling. And that actually means that you can get some serious action going in terms of the role of net worth on investment. And the, the, at the core of it all is the fact that collateral is playing this, or in this case, my house, was playing a dual role. Not only was it a factor of production, I was going to be living in it, but also it was the collateral against which I was borrowing. So, moving away from my autobiography, um, another fascinating penny that dropped when we were doing our research, it took about three years, was that collateral prices, in this in my case the price of houses, of course is a forward-looking animal. It, it's, the, it's what the market is willing to pay for an asset and the market's willingness to pay is determined by what the market perceives the asset is going to be delivering as a sequence of flows of return into the future. Now, taking the bernanke gertler logic that a negative shock today spawns a negative shock tomorrow and the next day and the next day, those negative shocks, that sequence of negative shocks, comes back to haunt you through the price of the collateral because the, or the assets that are being put up as collateral. So there's a very unpleasant two-way feedback from the present to the future thanks to observed by Bernanke Gertler, and then back from the future to the present, which was at the heart of the contribution, I think. It's one way to think about the contribution that uh, Kiyotaki and I made. And the upshot of all this in terms of placing it within the context of a, a, a macro model, as it's called, the, a model of the economy in the large, is that small shocks today can lead to depressions in asset prices, a reduction in the ability of entrepreneurs to borrow, and a shifting of assets away from, if you like, the good guys, the people with good ideas, into the hands of the people with less good ideas. And that means that overall the economy is producing less output than it otherwise would be able to. So small, temporary shocks, positive or negative, but let's say negative, shocks create long-run 
persistent and amplified effects in the economy at large. Well, um, soon after we'd wrote that, written that first paper in 1997, um, Nobu and I started to think about money, which, remember, was um, his paper with Randy Wright, a, a very famous paper, was something that uh, uh, Nobu made his name for, along with other things, um, in the past. We thought we would turn to think about money. And in obviously with a view ultimately to thinking about monetary policy. And we, money is a very slippery <laughs> concept and we decided the best way to think about money was not to think about money, but instead to think about liquidity and in particular the fact that different assets have different degrees of resaleability or liquidity as we call it. Money through that lens is simply one of a whole spectrum of assets, but money being the most liquid, let's say, of all. Um, so our hope was to generate a theory of money, a model of money, which where money emerges as a useful economic phenomenon without imposing special properties to it. Um, in other words, to understand money without assuming money. And we were, lucky, we were successful in this venture, and, and the paper that I think you're referring to was initially written and presented in the late 1990s, and uh, I remember presenting it in Stockholm in 2001, and then in some lectures I gave at the University of Oxford also in 2001. Um, Nobu and I are guilty of um, perfectionism when it comes to writing things up, and I'm, a, I'm embarrassed to say that we didn't finally write, rewrite the paper for the sixth or seventh time and, until uh, 2017, and it was, has been published in 2019. So this is a paper that started off in life, an idea that started in, uh, but wasn't published in 1999, but wasn't published until 20 years later. Now, in that paper, we essentially build what we think of as a, a modern take on Keynes or James Tobin more recently, but still one of the classic contributors to the literature. Keynes in economics in the last 30 years, 40 years perhaps, um, has focused in large part on stickiness of prices. That is to say that prices, whether it's for object, for commodities or labor, wages, don't necessarily move as freely as you might think, as our basic models presuppose. And through that, one can get a role for aggregate demand in affecting the behavior of the economy and a role for government policy. Now what, um, uh, and monetary policy. Now what Nobu and I were doing was to hark back to a much earlier interpretation of Keynes, this uh, James Tobin's interpretation of Keynes, which thinks in terms of a spectrum of liquidity of assets. Um, and that's the, um, that's our 2019 paper, but one that started, started that began in, 90, in the late 1990s. And uh, that, uh, in that paper, we, um, I think, we didn't quite know what we were about, but we, we realized that there, was a, it, there appeared to be a role for uh, the government, through the central bank, to purchase less liquid assets in exchange for more liquid assets, and in particular in exchange for money. And that is often thought of as quantitative easing or unconventional monetary policy more generally. And in the financial crisis of 2007, um, financial easing, uh, sorry, unconventional monetary policies of various forms and quantitative easing in, as a special form um, took center stage as one of the policy responses to the, to the financial uh, crisis that started in 2007. Now, the, so the, uh, um, I, people say that an intellectual 
precedent for uh, unconventional monetary policy was the paper that uh, Kiyotaka and I had written that was not published until 2019. Well, um, the COVID crisis is, as we all know, an even more severe crisis than the financial crisis of 2007-8-9. What it shares, what I spent in many respects all crises share, many crises share, is the importance of balance sheets and the, um, the ideas I've tried to describe earlier about how when firms and entrepreneurs' balance sheets are eroded, that has bad effects on the scale of investment and therefore on the scale of economic activity more generally. So the COVID crisis, certainly the erosion of balance sheets is an important component, but there are so many more aspects to the COVID crisis. Um, the COVID crisis is simultaneously a shock to supply uh, because of the need for lockdown. Supply has been severely hampered for, very, for many goods and services. And at the same time, it's the crisis has put the damper on demand, either because people are locked down and unable to spend, or more sort of in the Keynesian spirit, they, they, they lose they lost income and spend less as a result. So I think the COVID crisis will end up being the sort of test bed for macroeconomic modeling and thinking for years to come. We'll be talking about the COVID crisis. Um, it, it's, I have to say, I feel somewhat um, <laughs> pleased not to be a politician running things. It, it's as this interview is taking place, uh, the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, is delivering his. Uh, latest COVID budget, and I'd much rather be in my shoes than his. I have to say, the, it, it seems to me that there's a very large question hanging over the whole question of how we as a society deal with COVID, which is, to what extent should we help the current generation at the expense of future generations? How much debt should we as a society be willing to um, incur to help ourselves out now um, in order to, but at the expense of people who are not yet with us. Um, that's a moral question, every bit as much a moral question as it is an economics question. And uh, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in Rishi Sunak's shoes to have to uh, deal with it directly. Yes, actually, the earlier answer I gave um, is relevant here, that uh, in the Clarendon lectures I gave at Oxford in 2001, I, the, the overall title for the three lecture series was, uh, uh, about, was Liquidity. And it's the earlier point about not wanting to think about money as a special economic entity with peculiar properties, but rather to think in terms of the facility with which different assets can be used and resold by people in their need to shuffle resources and funding around. And um, that, by putting liquidity center stage, I, Nobu and I think that that is the right way to tackle monetary theory and monetary economics. So in that sense, I've, we feel that perhaps um, a better branch of our discipline, a better way to describe the branch of the, of the discipline would be liquidity economics um, rather than more narrowly monetary economics. 